Welcome everybody to the first live local Zoom that we've been able to do for the Writers Guild Foundation. I'm Dr. Roseanne Welch and I'm representing the Stevens College MFA in TV and screenwriting. We have all our students here live at the Jim Henson Studios in Hollywood, California. We're very excited to have you all on Zoom visiting with us. We're here tonight to talk with three amazing female writers in town, because our goal is to bring more female writers into this town. So I'm very pleased to be joined by Cheryl Anderson from Sweet Magnolia. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan Fisher from Never Have I Ever. Queen Sugar and a little bit of Sweet Magnolia. <laughs> All coming to us tonight. It's a pleasure. Yeah, we're very excited. Now, we advertised this originally as being about writing diverse families, and we've had a couple of family emergencies. How strangely apropos. So we lost a couple of our panelists who were going to represent other diverse families. So we've, we've pivoted, as is happening often in the world of COVID, to focusing on the, the beautiful fact that all of these shows deal with matriarchal three-generation families. And that's a very big interest to us, being able to see women at different ages of their life and how they relate, right? And how we move from being the daughters to the mothers to the grandmothers. So that's kind of going to be the focus of where we go tonight, which I think is, I think it's very interesting because I was raised by my grandfather. So we'll hear about everybody's grandmother. As a matter of fact, let's start with that question. Tell us about your grandmother. Who would like to start? Um, I'll start. Um, one of my grandmothers was an immigrant from Norway, and my other grandmother was uh, a New Englander all the way back to 1640. So uh, my father, uh, this was my mother's mother, my father always used to say that uh, her family had stowed away on the Mayflower and taken their time emerging. <laughs> Uh, so, so I grew up with a very distinct contrast between a family that was very rooted in their old world tradition um, and a family that was very New England to the point that we didn't really talk a lot about where they were from before they came. So, uh, but both very um, strong and um, firm in their beliefs, especially their beliefs in how things should be done. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I think that's the New England part. Um, but um, both incredibly dedicated to their families. And uh, unfortunately, my father's mother didn't live long enough to see me come out here. But my mother's mother did. Um, and I started in half hour. When I was little, my grandmother used to tell me, you have a fresh nap. <laughs> and I got on staff on my first half hour show and I called her and I said, Grandma, guess where my fresh nap got me? <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. That is so beautiful. Um, one of my grandmothers is still alive. She's 91. Uh, she lives outside of Atlanta. Um, and both, both of my parents are from Georgia, and so both of my grandmothers were from Georgia. And um, so I came from two uh, also very strong, uh, like, Southern ladies who, um, like, the, the one who passed away wanted to be buried with like Georgia tomatoes and, and whiskey. <laughs> so, yeah, was like, uh, and so I'm not sure if we actually did that. Um, I, um, but my other grandmother is like her personality. I think the, the closest comparison I can make, even though this character is not like, from Georgia, but it's, it's like the Dowager Countess from Downton Abbey. <laughs> like she is like, she's just like a little cold, but very funny. And, and both of my grandmothers are were really funny and really smart. And like, if they had been born at a different time, it would have been wild to see what they could have done because they just, they both were the smarter half in their, in their whole <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, the one that's still living uh, refuses to get Netflix, and so she has a. <laughs> 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 
not like in medical school. And she tells a very funny story about how like at some point when she was really pregnant with me, she like broke her leg and she like walked into the room of a patient who was like some like like old hillbilly. <laughs> and he like took one look at her and he was like, no. Which <laughs> is like fair. <laughs> and um and so you know she she has always been she's always pushed me because I think she watched a lot of her friends who did, didn't work get stuck in marriages and get stuck in things that like or get divorces and have no way to like support themselves and I think she felt this immense pride for having done this having become a doctor and I think it was a little hard for her initially when I wanted to go into this creative field because like it didn't have a track you know and it, it felt like you know there there's no guarantees and it, not that there's absolute guarantees for med school but it felt like when I was sort of trying to write I was doing some freelancing but I also had like weird day jobs like she was you know like what if you were an entertainment lawyer <laughs> I'm not I was like, why am I a lawyer? Why am I an entertainment lawyer? Like, I, you know, like, this is, I, I want to be, I want to write. I want to try this. I think I can do it. And, you know, I think she is really, was like really amazed and so proud when it actually worked out. And she is my biggest fan. And I think like she will watch, even if I like, wrote on one season of a show she'll watch the whole show like, um, <laughs> season one to you know the end and, and and i think you know it's it's in my family it's me and and five younger siblings but part of that's my mother got divorced in the middle and there are a bunch of half siblings and there's like house on hands on hands. <laughs> <laughs> too difficult to explain like everybody's got a different dad um but like <laughs> But, um, you know, but I have like a, a bunch of brothers and I'm her only daughter. And, um, and so she was harder on me than she was on them. And I think it like, it, it worked out <laughs> because of that. Like, I think she really was like, the world is hard on women who have to work so much harder than they do. And like, it was really drilled into me that I had to, and, and, you know, I, now I have a nice job, so I'm, <laughs> I'm happy she was that way. I wasn't happy at times, <laughs> but now I'm in. and she has nothing. And she has nothing. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> My mom was really to tell her story when she graduated high school, and she was. Um, had skipped a couple of grades. So she graduated high school when she was 16 and she wanted to continue to go to college. But at that time, her father was like, we well, don't need to go to college. Of course, she had met my father um, a couple of years prior. And so she said, I'm just going to get married with my baby. And so she got married at 16, but she graduated <laughs> high school. And um, so what was interesting when she raised us, I have two sisters is go to school, get a job, do what you want to do, and then get married. <laughs> you know, love my father, and um, but I loved us very much, but she totally encouraged us to do what we wanted to do. And of course, by the time we were college age, my grandfather was very concerned about what college we would go to. Mm -hmm. Times change. Um, and so, um, you know, my mom was very supportive of everything I did. And, you know, there was one show I was on. My mom passed some But there was one show I was on. And um, at one point, the showrunner did not pick up my country. And my mother never watched that show. <laughs> <laughs> she used to watch it before I was even on staff, but after that, they didn't treat me well. She's not watching <laughs> I like her. Yes. Very strong. All right, so now that we've heard about these amazingly cool women, 
how do you think they've influenced a storyline that you've been able to tell in the current show you're on or earlier shows that you may have been on? How have you mined their experiences to create or to bring them to life in a story? Somebody pointed out to me two or three or four shows ago um, that um, I specialize in women who um, try to do the right thing even under difficult circumstances. And that is completely my mother and my grandmother's. Um, and added on to that, that um, church uh, is, is um, a very big part of my family's life. And my mother always said, you got to give people another chance. And um, certainly in the current show in Sweet Magnolias, um, all the women are circling those questions, but coming at it from somewhat different perspectives. But I think Maddie, our protagonist, is the most centered on you need to give people a second chance, even when it's hard, because it's the right thing to do. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, and at a like very basic level, I never have I ever. The mom is the doctor. Um, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and both Mindy and I had mothers who were doctors, and so um, that was like a thing that you know, where like a generation of mother just weren't as many women doctors. So we, you know, it was like important to us to to give her that. And um, but I think for me, it's like. I think this is not unique to my life, but I do feel like my show in many ways is about the sort of feeling like the the the, the rage that you feel at your mother all the time <laughs> because you need her so desperately. You know what I mean? It's like you're so mad at like my mom was visiting, I mean, you know, like a couple weeks ago, and I like had like some, I had to like hire someone to trim a tree because like the branches were on my roof and it was a fire hazard and like she was just sitting like oh, you like did you talk to the neighbors first did you get their permission to trim that tree and I was like well it's on my side of the property and she's like I have seen so many lost <laughs> and I was just like why do you want to use that tone <laughs> Because my mother, um, she's 
follows from Kentucky, Hopkins from Kentucky. And she hated being sent down south in the summertime. So she never sent us down south in the summertime. But working on Sweet Magnolias, recognizing the connection, especially between a small southern town and your great migration family from the south, that all trickled in. It just has a little bit of a urban Chicago flair to it, mm -hmm. but I could relate to everything that was happening in this, um, in this town and the people, because it's family, it's heart, it's loyalty, it's courage, and both shows, Magnolias and Sugar, it's about that. It's about being true to your family, supporting your family. Loving the family in that And uh, those are values that I think translate whether you didn't know this time. <laughs> and uh, I actually kind of think any show is a family drama. I mean, looking at a cop show, all those cops working together, they, that's found family. I mean, it's a family drama. Somebody's the dad. <laughs> somebody's a baby brother, somebody's a little sister, and um, it's really a great, you know, those family matters, your family, your experience as a sibling, as a daughter, as a parent, translate always to whatever you like. That's so true. Which leads me to this idea of, can you tell us about an episode where you were able to tell a story that came out of your own mother-daughter exchange at some point, something that was definitely, I pulled this out of my life and getting to watch these characters live through it, either the same way or either fixing the ending the way it should have been. But. My mother's gone. But on Sweet Magnolias, I have been able to have Maddie have conversations with her mother that I have had with my mother in prayer. And that has been um, really powerful. And, uh, you know, as you were saying, they, they never leave you. They're with you always. Uh, and um, it was really uh, meaningful, but also joyous to say, you know, I know had I had this conversation with my mother, this is exactly how it would have gone. <laughs> and uh, to be able to frame it in that and Paula's relationship and then share it with people. Um, I know she's a boy. Oh, so beautiful. Yay! <laughs> Um, I think, you know, I'm so beautiful. What I'm going to say is just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one hour a year, half hour. That's your job. It's half hour. You're in comedy. You just don't. Those are more than you. No, uh, I, I mean, you know, a lot of, there is some drama in our, in my show. And it, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I would say this season, uh, you know, we, we actually decided to explore Melanie's mother, her, her like, having like a love interest. And we got like beautiful comments to come and, and be on the show. Um, <laughs> it's the nicest man in the world. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my mother was divorced. She, she was not a, a widow, but she, um, she, like, you know, we date, and I was always mad about it. You know? <laughs> and I was such a jerk to every person that she dated. <laughs> and there was something nice about writing this, like, writing it from Melanie's perspective of, mm -hmm. like, letting, like, a mother be human and have love and, like, 
seeing her try to be happy and also to see that it's, it was more nuanced than that. It's like she she's lonely. She's like grieving and she's, you know, she's she's trying this relationship. She knows she's not ready for it, but she's having this moment with him. And, and you know, and, and I, I, I think that like I felt those feelings that Davy, that our lead ha had when she like found out there was a boyfriend, like the just like visceral rage that like a teenager feels when they feel like someone's not putting them first and someone's like moving on or like ditching the life that they were clinging to. And so, you know, a lot of those scenes were, were you know, came from a real place that I certainly have felt, but also similar to what you're talking about, like I, writing the part about Melanie and how like and, and making her an imperfect human person like also like helped like kind of heal some of that like the the rage that I like you know felt as like a young person at my mom. So yeah. Right in therapy guys. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent thank you. Yeah, I can't really pinpoint um a scene or dynamic with mother daughter that we because as I became an adult, my mom um, was more my friend. And I love the transition from mom to friend because she's definitely a mom. Um, <laughs> she was not a mom that was like, oh, I want to be your friend. <laughs> uh, but once I went out on my own um, and we connected again, I could see her as a human being. And who she was and what she wanted and what her goals were. And one of the things I discovered about her is wanting, she wanted to be a writer too. And I've discovered some of her writing and encouraged some of her writing. She wrote poetry. She used to write. We left our school books out, we go get our notebooks, and there'd be something all about the teacher that we did not write. <laughs> <laughs> she would, well, not really awful, but just something quirky and fun um, that you had to rip out and throw away. And then, um, but she also wrote poetry and she, you know, would write stories. And it, it wasn't on one of the recent shows, but actually it was on Touch by Angel. And the, the episode I wrote where uh, Roma's character goes to a writing retreat. And um, having that experience of having to write to heal a family situation. And that's something that sometimes if my mother was really mad, she would write us a letter. And no one ever wanted to get a letter. <laughs> <laughs> I love my mother, especially if we were like if I was away at college, she was concerned about me and she wrote me a letter so I couldn't come <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, because it was uh, um, it was reasoned and well written and you know, but it was uh, a way to make us think about what it was we were doing. <laughs> and uh, so that uh, episode where she had to Dr. Martin was my mom. Uh, in that, in that show, she had to, she wrote a poem for her son's wedding to acknowledge that she was okay with being married to Nicole, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who had um, HIV. And so it was that whole drama of that. And so that kind of writing to heal and to make amends is something that, and sometimes we we'll write. That. But but for me it's down. My father was the talker. He never wanted to get a talk. And uh, it's because it was just long and easy and boring. <laughs> and I just get punishment. Do I have to sit and listen to it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a funny story. We, to this day, my sisters and I rarely take pain for us. Because if we were kids, we'd go, oh, they had five and asked for my wedding. And he's like, what were you doing when you first realized you had <laughs> Did you have sufficient money? <laughs> when was the last time you ate? <laughs> when was your last bomb? What was that? <laughs> 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 
somewhere and I don't just deal with it. And to this day, if I have a headache or something, I'm like, oh, man, the dish just goes down. It's like, you know, you're taking an expert. The things we learned from childhood that we carry all our lives. <laughs> the other thing with, with my parents, and my mom really, and I blame them for being single. <laughs> Because they created a partnership. And when my mother decided she wanted to go back and get the degree that her father denied her, my father bought her this nice desk where she could do her work. And when he got a motorcycle and wanted to travel, he didn't like the motorcycle, but she got on the back of that motorcycle to take those road trips with her. And they never argued in front of us, um, but if they had something to discuss, they would do it as a team, and then come to us in the United Front. And seeing that partnership that they had as parents, it's like, where am I going? <laughs> but it was an effort on her part, and on his part. And they, well, they practically worked together, so that's how that, that would work. So, it was a lesson for me when I see a couple, um, how they can work things out. And I have to figure out, okay, how do I mess this up? <laughs> so, not true. Well, no, in the story. In the story talk. Talk. Yeah, that's, story true. Talk. that's true. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Said, well, my mom would, she would give him the sign of treatment. And, stuff. <laughs> and then he would go see me how long the sign lasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know you're doing. You're talk to her. She never wrote him a letter. Just two children. They know it. Yeah. 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 This is very true. And it's true. The secrets that we don't know. Yeah. Oh, I can write something. Here's a thought. What is an issue that you are happy, whether it's a mother daughter issue, maybe it's a, just a family issue in general? That you're happy that you've been able to highlight in the course of your work, whether again it's on a current show or a previous show, uh, a story that you're happy that you were able to bring out using the, the confines of the show that you're on. That was good. Spell ready for that. It was the same episode of Touch by Nature. My sister told me um, she was watching the show and the character is packing some books out of the garage and she's like, Oh, look at this book. I remember the five old peppers and how it grew. And my sister was watching the show. She says, Oh, I read that. Oh, wow. And she said, Oh, my sister wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's a little thing like that. <laughs> my mother used to read to us as we were kids. And that was one of the books she read. So cool. Oh, cool. Um, issues wise, you know, there's a lot of things I look at it that we tackle on camera. However, I, I think, you know, one of the bigger things that I, I feel proud of is that we, that our show kind of centers around like mental health and like that, like, shows a, like a young person, you know like a young South Asian person going to therapy and like dealing with grief and like, you know, worried about feeling crazy and worried about like her like explosive emotions that, you know, um, I, I hope that that, you know, I think particularly after the year that we've had, you know, like, I know that like uh, depression and suicides and all sorts of things skyrocketed, particularly among young people. And I just hope that seeing that is helps some people feel more okay with it. And, and you know, like, and it opens like a, a opens up a dialogue about just like mental health for young people. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of things I feel good about, but that, that one to me, I feel, it feels very important right now, so. Oh, and I love the fact that you haven't solved it in one or two episodes, obviously. Yeah. Like, we never will. <laughs> <laughs> like, but it was, you know, it's a process, right? I think we want 
we want her to be a, a person in process because like also you know i think uh, not to knock any other like young adult series but i uh, we really wanted our show to you know reflect how like immature and like messed up teenagers are you know like we wanted to see that like they often are selfish and they often make like you know poor decisions and like get in trouble with their friends because they're so desperate for acceptance and you know like are have very fragile egos and have stuff that they are unable to process i mean my my dad died when I, I was in my early 30s, but I have a much younger sister who was 17 when it happened. And like, she just could not cope. And like, it, you know, and, and it was like, I, a lot of what I, uh, a lot of what we write for Dandy is, is not exactly how she dealt with it, but it, it's inspired by the inability to process it, you know, and, um, and so, you know, I, I think that you know, my hope is that it, it sort of like inspires the people to seek out help and say, and some Nazi. And some Nazi, anybody, literally all. We have a sort of sins of the father theme that runs through Sweet Magnolias in that the, the inciting incident is a messy divorce. And um, I think one of the most important things that, that we've looked at is that um, family can be a trajectory, but not a definition. Um, and we have had a lot of adults on our show tell younger people, um, this does not define you. This is not your burden. Um, what that person did is their business. You have choices um, because particularly in small towns, based on the writers in our room who are from small towns, um, you sort of get, oh, you're a, you know, you're an Anderson, you're a McLean, you're a whatever, and that's just all people want to see from you, all they expect from you. And it was very important for me, particularly because I had gone through not a splendid divorce shortly before we started the show um, to reassure my kids this has nothing to do with you. Um, and to, to the larger issue of other people's sins should not be better to find you. That you're on your own path. Um, and you may stumble, but the world is full of people who will come along beside you and pick you back up. And if that's your family, that's wonderful. And if your family's not capable, then it's your friends or your co-workers or everybody has their support system in the That's beautiful. People need to seek out those support systems. Absolutely. For mental health and uh, just to understand where you fit in or where you refuse to fit in. Uh, sure. Well, sure. Excellent, excellent. So let's think about one of my favorite questions. Let's start writing in general. When in life did you know you were a storyteller? I don't remember, and this is sound corny, I don't remember a time when I wasn't. Both my parents were terrific storytellers. Um, my father was always the one in the corner of the cocktail party making everybody laugh. And I can remember as a kid memorizing one of his jokes and telling it to my friends, and my friends were all like, what? <laughs> and like, I know it made everybody laugh at the thing Saturday. Um, and uh, I, I thought I wanted to be a novelist um, in elementary school. Um, and, and my parents took us to the theater a lot and to movies a lot. And so I went from novelist to playwright, and that's what I went to college for, uh, was playwriting. 
And then a friend said, uh, you should come out to LA because the weather's better and the money's better. <laughs> um, and here I am. <laughs> but it, storytelling was always, um, you know, and it goes back to my grandmother's. Uh, you know, my grandmother, my father's mother would tell us stories about uh, her childhood in Norway. My Yankee grandmother had stories generations back, and she was married to a Scottish immigrant. Yeah, you know, so there, there was a lot of oral history presented with a tremendous amount of humor. Um, and uh, some of it blue, depending on who was telling the story. Um, and so, but I also think part of being a military kid is you learn to tell your story so that you can introduce yourself to the new group of people. So it's just always part of it for me. Really cool. Um, I don't think I knew I wanted to be a writer until kind of late. Uh, but I think I was always a, a storyteller. Uh, I think as a kid, I was a, just a giant liar. <laughs> like, really, I was like a huge liar. Like, I really remember a, like, show and tell in, like, kindergarten where I was just like, I have to tell, like, to do tell, and, like, just stood up in front of us and, like, told them all how I was rescued that morning from, from like, local lake by my dog. <laughs> <laughs> and my team, you're gonna see my team being like, <laughs> right, like, like, thank you so much. I was like, no problem. Just wanted to let you guys know that I was rescued by a dog, like on a TV show. Um, but I see my dad, my dad's family were all so funny, such great storytellers. Like always had really funny little like ways of explaining things to you like i remember i like got too drunk at my cousin's wedding and my dad was like you've got a lot of pathology in the family you've got a lot of pathology you're gonna wanna get a handle on it and i was like what's happening i like there's an open bar and i'm 22 like i just wanted to put it like that and then he's like they told me a long story about how he had some like great grandfather who was like a drunk who like was a judge and he would go to the bar and they had like crawl home lighted matches. I'm like, I'm not gonna do this. I'm in LA, you know. <laughs> crawl home with matches. Uh, like like had like very funny ways of talking, and then my mother was really obsessed with movies and like loved movies so much and still does. It's like and like I, even, I never like put any restrictions on like what we could want because she just like wanted like she also treated me as her best friend from a very early age. And I just remember like us like just like me and my brothers like all sitting around like maximum age is like eleven or something. And she's like, all right, this is a new movie called Basic Instinct. <laughs> And it's like, why are we, what? <laughs> like, put like, restrictions. <laughs> but, you know, they, like, both sides of my family, like, definitely, like, instilled these things in me. But I, you know, I initially, like, thought I wanted to be, like, an actress, and then, like, but I also went to college for, like, international, and, like, like relations, like I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. And then like at some point I um, was doing like improv and uh, a like job, what I, like I knew someone, who knew someone through like improv or something like that. There was like gonna be like a job opening at the Onion and then I like got this job and I really was scared and was like, cool. I'm like a good writer. Like, I'm not going to actually do this. And, but, and I wasn't that good. To be honest, I was not good when I started. I'm just like, please don't fire me. Please don't fire me. <laughs> and then after some years and like practice, that I, you know, I, I started to like, wait, I think this is right for me. And then when I got my first TV job, like my first big TV job, which was on 30 Rock, I like went 
when I was sitting in the writer's room, I was like, oh, these are my people. And like, that was like when I was like, this is correct. Like, this is exactly where I should be. And like, I have, you know, and from that day forward, I have not looked back. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I wrote as a, as a kid because you have to in school. And, you know, speaking of family, um, and it's all relative. Um, <laughs> we can't even make up my cousins. Uh, this is part of this. And the Woods family tells stories. And a, a, a phrase my father used to, if anyone interrupted him, he would say, Who's telling this lie? <laughs> <laughs> and the storytelling is, yeah, in our family, you just listen to the stories. And, yeah. Uh, and so my father also loved movies, and my mother wasn't a movie goer, so we would go to movies. And then um, I thought I was, again, I was going to be an actress. Um, in high school, I um, <clears throat> thought I was going to be a doctor. And then I said, oh, I have to take chemistry. And then I said, oh, no. I'll be a lawyer. Because, you know, you're supposed to, you know, young black woman, you know, you can do anything now, you know? So I'll be a lawyer. And um, then I did my trial. And one time I was a prosecutor, one time I was a defense attorney. And both times I got the guy off on the same crime. <laughs> and I'm like, ooh, slippery slope. <laughs> 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 the lawyers were saying you should be a lawyer. <laughs> and then it was, um, I was an actor, and um, I said, I can be, I can act as a doctor or a lawyer. And then I um, moved to New York and was doing the acting thing, and I realized that not a lot of people were writing for black women. And I had to do a showcase, so I wrote something for myself. And then, the agent was like, what's that from? And my teacher said, always tell them it's from a play a friend of yours is writing. Yeah. <laughs> because otherwise, they think you can only act what you write. Mm -hmm. So then everybody in my acting class was like, oh, write me something. Like that. <laughs> so then I started writing monologues for everybody in my class. And then um, I said, hey, that's right. <laughs> And I published a book of my works, um, so published um, called Something for Everyone, a Saving Righteous Book. And um, I self-published, and then I sold them out. And um, every, first, I wanted to get it published, and they said no. Then I self-published and sold out. And then they said, okay, add 25 more and publish it. And I said, ooh, right, maybe, maybe it'll work. And it reminded me of the one time in high school we had to write an essay for Miss Eckhart. And she was the toughest English teacher in our school. And we had to write an essay about some literature, medieval stuff, but Canterbury tales. <laughs> and Miss Eckhart would sit in the back and listen to everybody's report, and she would just be writing. And she wasn't even looking at it. But I started mine, and it was this story. I was telling the story. And she stopped and she looked and she said that. And then she just listened to my whole story. Who <laughs> knows? <laughs> and that's how writing became I wrote a play. I said I could write a play for me to act in. And then I turned that play into a screenplay. And then I moved out here and that screenplay got me into the Disney Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And it's been writing ever since. Except that one time I got to do a big part on the show. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. So that's, I guess it was at that point as an actor that I started writing for myself and then writing for other actors that I said, this might be a thing. It's right. And it is. And I have to say that acting really helps if you've never taken any acting classes. Take acting classes in culture. Really also, if you're interested in comedy writing, like improv is incredibly helpful for comedy writing to be in a comedy writer's room because that is kind of what the, the vibe is in comedy writers. I think improv is important in a drama room too, and it's just uh, the ability to jump off of what somebody else, the, the whole yes and mentality of improv is crucial. Yeah. Good. 
Good less let's all around. Uh, okay, so now that we're all writers, we, we've established you all become writers, right? What theme do you think runs through your body of work? What are the themes you find yourself returning to that means something to you or the message that you, you, your work is putting out of the world? Redemption. Um, and I, I say that as a Lutheran, but uh, I also say that as, again, I seem to be drawn to characters who are seeking second chances. And um, so I, I have um, I have embraced that and uh, really enjoyed digging deeply into that because redemption has a lot of faces. And as we say on Sweet Magnolias, everyone on our show is worthy of redemption. It's just going to take some of them a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's from the other shows you work on. So. Um, I do. It wasn't a conscious thing earlier. Um, it was just those were the stories that I got really excited about. Um, but as I've done more and more uh, creating, uh, it's yeah, it's very very important to me. Uh, and it's it's an important theme in my own life. So you know, life imitates art, imitates life. Then it's a big circle. And let me just follow that up because you adapted a book series. Mm -hmm. How much of you did you bring to that versus what was the kind of existence in the book that you were given the IP? We talked about that. Um, there's. Uh, I really admire the world that Miss Woods created, not this Miss Woods. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl Woods, who wrote the novels uh, that we're dealing with. Um, but there, there's a lot of me in the foundation. Um, and then a lot of every writer who's been in the room in the walls. That's pretty good to say. I have to say that. Speaking about what Cheryl did with Sweet Magnolias, because I'm adapting the book to TV too. And I read the books, and you know, they've got a thing to it. But the layers that Cheryl brought to the adaptation, um, you know, there's not in the And when you look at that show, you see the depth of the relationships and what they're going through, and you know, I look at that as a, um, I mean, it, it's, it's comparable to what Ava did with Ava DuVernay. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we know who she is. I've heard of her before. I say that like we're like the closest friends. So I was on the show for a season, and it was a wonderful season. Um, uh, you but go back to how I'm like her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When you read Queen Sugar and watch the show, it's like it's the same world, but her intention and intent and to tell story and adapt it is so strong. I mean, the Noah character who's vital to the series is not in the book, you know. And the same with um you know, if you've seen season one, it's like, oh, Sweet Magnolia, it's like, who's in the car? And it's like, oh, I'll read the books. And it's like, don't read the books. <laughs> <laughs> because the intent of the storytelling and the layers that are added to the show can still maintain the intent of the original story. That is really key. And I'm Adapting a book now, and you know, our good friend Ken is adapting. No, he, well, he read the script and he's like, drop the book, drop the book. And I'm like, no, I'm not dropping the book, kid. <laughs> it's like, no, that's very important. That's why we're watching because we read the book and love it. However, there is room to, and this is what we're talking about in my the other panel, but there's room to bring your voice your vision. Um, there's a great story um, that, um, and I don't know which story, so I can't tell it, but I was at a panel with the and the author of the book, and she talked about how 
her first draft for Miss Winfrey was a true adaptation of the book. And Miss Winfrey was like, I wanted something more. And she's like, okay. So she did another draft. And she threw in everything she loved about New Orleans and the South and all these things. And Miss Winfrey was like, mm -hmm. okay, so when I want to eat on the show, uh, that's a little too much. <laughs> and then this was the note um, that Edwina shared at the end. She was given this gift from this book. What are the things that you want to write about? The things that are important to you that you want to explore using this world as your canvas. And so she wanted to write about social justice and things like that. So Nova was one as a journalist who was an activist. She wanted to write about what celebrity did to marriages and families. And so Charlie's not a widow, a military guy. She's married to a, a famous pro athlete. And they, her daughter is now a son because she wanted to see how young black men of privilege are impacted when you know, they move to another area. So all of the things that were important to her, she put into that show, but kept the intent of the author about African Americans owning land and the struggles of doing that and within a family dynamic. And so all of those stories with Darla and then Blue and all of that, those are stories she wanted to talk about. And so I saw that as well, like Ava Cheryl did. <laughs> <laughs> So it's um, taking the, the foundation of that book, not losing serenity, not losing that small town and the community and all of those things, but then diversifying it. Because I think the, the main characters in the book were all various shades of blonde. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and so there's a whole different dynamic with the three women. And oh my goodness, it's the same feeling of friendship and loyalty and all those things, but you've got a diverse group of women, so it takes on a whole other level of um, importance. And so that's the creative aspect of adapting a book to give it a fresh, I mean, Richard would be the same. I mean, my goodness. Um, so it's, um, it's really important to, to think about what are the things you want to say without losing what attracted you to the property in the first place. William Goldman said that as well. Not I know it's up there. <laughs> no. I, you know, okay, I can go home now. Ava, William, and me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, that you will have to invent things when you're adapting a book to a film media. But the thing you must not do is um, Ignore the intention of the original, or else you won't. By extent, you are referencing also theme, oh, theme and tone, absolutely. and all of that. Exactly, yeah, so that's what drew you to it. But now you're going to add your own layers upon that. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And we're not going to mention the show. That's all right. Ages. <laughs> no, Grace, what about your own themes that like will bring to land? What, what themes do you find coming out of your work? Optimism. That um, an accepting challenge and all of those things and never, um, never getting up. Maybe perseverance, but um, it's. And what I love about a show like Ted Lasso is just because he's an optimist and doesn't mean he doesn't have drama and conflict and conflict and really tough things to deal with. Space. Space. You know, yeah. and just because you're optimistic doesn't mean you're Pollyanna and you think he's got a game. <laughs> um, but how do you maintain that? And what drives you to hold that? And that's a deep intention of faith, love, um, and, and, and a belief in the underlying good of humanity. And so many things 
can tend to make us make bad choices doesn't necessarily mean we're bad people. Um, but that optimism, and you can only change you. And that impact of doing that internal work can inspire other people to do it. I just read a clip that said, to that song makes me want to be a better person. <laughs> just never try to change anybody. But he's just being him. And so that kind of thing of optimism, perseverance, and yeah, nobody says it's going to be 100% or it's going to last forever. Or, but I, I can't be a simple. Why? What do you think about scenes? Um, you know, in my work, I think I, I, I do like a story about like an underdog, like I like someone who's like, you know, the, they're not like an unlikely lead or an unlikely hero, someone who like, you know, uh, things don't come easily to go and they like struggle, but, but yeah, similarly, without saying like that, uh, they have hope, like they hope against hope that they like can have the life they want. And I mean, I think also just you know because I'm in comedy. I mean, I think I'm always drawn to just like the comedy of of, of people who take themselves too seriously. You know, like I I often like you know I feel like there's those people that you meet that like it's like. They are in a drama of their own making. <laughs> like, oh, okay. like I, I love like everyday things that are so absurd and funny and like that like cut the like the anxiety and distress that is like you know being alive and like you know particularly right now like when it feels like everything's so charged and stressful you know I I think it's it's important to find levity where you can find it. And I think when you find levity in things, you find humanity, you know? And it's like finding the comedy and in, in, in stuff that is dark and feels oppressive and feels like it, you know, like if you if you think on it too long, you will have a panic attack. Like finding like the funny moments in that like are, I think like do make you optimistic. And they also, I, I think, kind of unify us all, you know, like you can't, uh, you know, it's like, regardless of your political beliefs, like it's funny when Trump's hair gets like blown around, you know, like it's like finding like these little foibles, like when you just like realize we're all just like, like trying our best to not humiliate ourselves, you know, like, that's, that's everybody you know human and, and I don't know I, I think a lot of my work kind of like plays on that well it's coping is laughter is coping it is and we definitely need that to get through absolutely it's beautiful beautiful I want to have a chance to open it up to folks in the room if they have questions going on there's some questions in here about any shows about what people are writing any of that Oh, yes. I guess is there anything that you haven't written that you want to write or any of that would do any shows or any themes that you haven't explored that you know if there's something darker or lighter or a different thing that you do want to explore that I know maybe the, the, the incubator year of the pandemic has brought to the floor. And that was very good enough to think you need to repeat it or go to Yeah. <laughs> themes you wish you could explore, themes that have come to you in this world this year of pandemic. I mean, I, this is the theme. I, I think, like, I, I hope at some point to do like a show that, like, is like is some kind of a period piece. Like, I think I, I, I like love the idea of doing a comedy that's not now, and um, I don't know what that is, <laughs> but it is. It, I do, I do love a show that really has its own universe and it's its own world and doesn't look like any other show. You know, I. Uh, you know, like Ted Lasso kind of has that going on. It's very like specific, um, 
I love I love Atlanta. Um, it hasn't been on in a long time, but the world is so specific, and like the characters are really specific, and, and so you know I think also you know, these are those are both modern shows, but um, but I, I do think like I'd like to create something where uh, you feel like it's it's a really specific world with like that like looks like nothing else, you know, and, and I think sometimes if you, you move something to a different era, you can keep that. I want to do a noir detective show. <laughs> because? Um, because um, I grew up reading those novels and watching those movies. And um, there's just something about, you know, being in LA at a certain time of night when the lights are on. You know, Raymond Chandler, you know, and it's just like that. Yeah, and you know, it, it, it's, it's purely a fan thing. It's not a thematic thing. It's just, uh, you know. I know the next Humphrey Bogart and Laura McCall are out there and I want to write for them. <laughs> that was, you know, I, I'm with both of you on both of those things. Um, there is an author and I, I had lots of options for one of her novellas, um, but African American is still I'm ready. I've got I'm, Beverly Jenkins is a brilliant writer. And I want to caution you all. I think there should be a very chance. Because I feel like that's a missing link in our viewing uh, world. Uh, because there's a period from 1865 to 1900 of the lives of African Americans we have not seen. And Nothing else to sell. But Detroit, a lot of her stories take place in Detroit or in the back or the West. And um, you should not give away this idea. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm not, I'm not <laughs> Great, let's stop. <laughs> and I've got uh, a Christmas story that's a her Christmas novella. And I'm writing it and got to get it because that's what. So I'm actually doing what I'm wanting to see. Yeah. We have a Zoom question here that I think is an interesting thing for people uh, overall to think about. When you're used to writing alone, writing on your own materials and whatnot, how, um, what did you have to learn or teach yourself in order to move into working in the writer's room and dealing with all the other thoughts and ideas that come together? It's a place where you don't have to think of everything by yourself. <laughs> and the, the thing is, is you know, uh, Anthony Sparks uh, was the show for this season. Of, well, it's been the last three seasons. Um, you get a group of people who can jam up with each other and stories just start flowing and it's it's great. That was not a big adjustment to me. In fact, the first show I was on, um, I was staff writer, and there were five executive producers. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them were writing teams. But um, Carol McKeon, I don't know if you know Carol, but um, she was one of the execs, and she was like, no, speak up. <laughs> it's like, if you don't speak up, it's going to get lost. I and mean, that was like, my first lady from the staff writer was executive producer. But it was a, a, such a great invitation as a new writer from the first show to contribute. And I've loved it ever since. Yeah. Okay. I think it's like often hard. I've, uh, I've never been in a drama room, so I'm not. I have my ideas of how it's different from the <laughs> comedy room, but I'm terrible. But not the comedy rooms. I think really, my impression is comedy rooms are are scarier in, in in the way that you you feel like you have to be a little on and you have to like pitch jokes and 
particularly as like a staff writer, your main job is to pitch jokes. It's like less about pitching story ideas and it's more to help make it funnier. And I think particularly for women, it is it 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 tends to make us sometimes like go inward if we feel like we're not doing a good enough job. And when I was like, I, a lot of times I feel like our male counterparts are like, I'm hilarious, even if they're getting nothing in the script. Just, like, <laughs> from a level of confidence that's just like, <laughs> but, but like I, you know, I certainly don't have. Um, and what I would say is when you're used to writing on your own and you um, and you get that opportunity uh, to to even if you don't mean it, try to pretend you have a thick skin. And, uh, <laughs> like, just put your head down and like try to like keep going. And, and don't like beat yourself up if you don't get things in the script or if it feels like you, you know, you're you're blowing it. it what you what you tend to do, I, at least what I tend to do is like. And I don't do it anymore, so it gets better. But I, I, I do feel like when you're young, like or not young, when you're new to like the the room, like you pay so much more attention to yourself than anybody else is, is paying attention to you. You know what I mean? Like as the showrunner, I have you know uh, like ten other writers that write with me, and like I, you know, like I'm grateful for any like morsel I can put in the script that I think is funny. In it. But I am not keeping track of how many jokes a person has gotten in this draft. Like, I am just like putting stuff in, but if you are the person who's like, I haven't spoken in 20 minutes, like I haven't said a thing, I have not said one thing in 20 minutes, and like the thing I said 20 minutes ago was that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you gotta figure out a way to like, let these things roll off your back and just know like that you weren't supposed to be amazing out of the gate. You know what I mean? Like you, it is like anything, it's a practice, you get better. Um, and I would say for those of you who can, try to like show your work to as many people now as you can. I mean, you're in this program, so you're showing your work a lot, but like get a lot of criticism. Like try to get used to things getting like cut and like like throw things away and just like, you know, make it so that things aren't as precious to you. Uh, the nicest, like, I got this really nice first job at The Onion where my whole job was to write, like, hundreds of headlines and almost none of them were ever used. You know what I mean? It was like one would be used every now and then because there was 40 people writing 100 headlines and it was just like they only used, like, 10. And so, you know, you, everything you wrote to got thrown in the trash. It was such a good practice for me to just like let go of stuff. And I, I feel like this is, you know, I'm sure the same for grammar groups. Like if you're pitching story ideas that don't get used or if, you know, character arcs that everyone's like, I don't know if that works. And, and sometimes when you're the showrunner, you forget to be as sensitive as you should be. You're like, you're just like, oh, no, that's like, right, right. And then you like move on, but you don't realize that you, you might have like stunned someone. And, and I really try so hard to be incredibly aware and sensitive but you also are like moving on a train that has like like incredible demands that you have to, to finish. Um, but I would try, I guess my point is, is, is try to realize like that when you're a staff writer, your first job, you are a new employee in a company. And that doesn't mean you should be the president already. And like, if you're not as good as your executive producer yet, like that, there's a reason. Like that person has been doing this for 10 years and you know, like you're starting out. So like give yourself the room to grow and learn and like get better and don't beat yourself up about it. I've just seen so many like female comedy writers just drop out of the game, just like quit because it just like, they're just like, I'm not good at this and I can't do it. And like, whatever. And it's like, you did like you didn't even give yourself the chance to learn, like to like to get better, and um, and you know like that. I, so that to me, like, and not I'm like talking for so long, but I do really feel so passionately about this because like I I think that if you don't beat yourself up about it, you will keep trying, 
And what I see a lot of times is if someone starts out pitching a lot and they're not getting a lot of stuff in, then they start pitching less and less and less until they become a truly quiet person in the room. And then when they're not talking at all, then you, you truly can't like keep them on staff for the next year. You know what I mean? Like you need people to participate. So if you can motivate yourself to be like, I, I remember at 30 Rocks, like, I didn't know what I was doing. I pitched so much stuff that like just was nothing was terrible. But I kept being like, this is your job. If you were the mailman, you would have to go to every house and <laughs> continue to deliver the mail. And even if someone told you that your mail delivery was not great, <laughs> you will have to keep going. Like they're paying you to talk. Like you have to do it. And so like, and, and by the like end of that first season, like, I was a little better. <laughs> so I wasn't ready to run my own show and I wasn't amazing yet, you know? I'm like, I'm not amazing now. I'm like really just doing it, you know? <laughs> I'm working my way there, but like, yeah. But anyway, this is a very long way to think that I really just needed to impart it to all of you guys, nice ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and that you just have to push through. And I think all our, our all our friends out in the audience, remember they're all behind the little screen as well. <laughs> so you can hear all, all my Zoom friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I I have done both half hour and hour. Um, they both have their charms. They both have their horrors. Mm -hmm. um, but building off what Lyme is saying, I think the most important thing to do, and this will sound ridiculous, but you've really got to do it. You can't be afraid. Um, you have to pitch in faith, not in fear. Um, because if you sit there and second guess yourself, um, you, you don't get anything on the table, so it's never going on the board. Uh, and you are letting great pitches sit in your head while somebody else is pitching them. You got to trust your first instinct. You got to stay in the moment. You have got to stay in the story. And yes, 90% of what you pitch will never see the light of day. But that 10% is going to become part of a story because you stayed in the moment. You stayed in the group dynamic. You were pitching for the story, not for yourself. And if you keep pitching, then that 10% is bigger than if you pitch twice a day. So just know that you earned your seat at the table and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Also, sometimes when you pitch something that doesn't go in, like it spurs someone else to think of the thing that actually you do use. Like it is useful to have people talking and like, you know, bouncing ideas that you can make your way to the final product. Most of the time things that go in to any script or stories are not one person's oh, idea. Absolutely. It's usually like a eight person, like, 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 and then it like becomes the thing that you want. It, and this goes back to why improv classes are so great mm -hmm. because you just take something and build on it and then somebody says, well, let's go to the right and then let's go to the left and then, you yeah, know, you build it together. Yeah. True. Excellent advice. Other questions? In front of me, before I go back to the Zoom questions. Yes. Now, thank you so much for sharing everything. It's been such an inspiring and insightful afternoon. So I do love to say thanks to each of you for sharing your stories. Um, I wanted to know when we were talking about writing about like your mothers or family, is there any time that you feel like you have to give yourself permission to write or there are things you wouldn't write about your family or... Do you feel like if you were going to write about a sibling, then would they know that, that they were writing? Or how do you feel about writing about people in the future? I mean, I, I, I don't know if I would ever do like an autobiographical story about my family, but, but just when I use them as inspiration, if something is really close to home, if something is like a, um, like, for instance, uh, in Never Have I Ever, Davy has a psychosomatic weakness where she loses the love, like the use of her legs because her, she watches her father die in front of her. It's a comedy. <laughs> but but uh, my, my, one of my brothers weirdly had a, an unexplained 
paralysis in high school, like where he was just paralyzed from the waist down for three months. And I think like we never figured out what it was. Like we have no idea. And, um, you know, when I, we decided to like give her this, I, you know, asked his permission and, I, you know, I was like, listen, like we think this would be an interesting character trait for her. And, you know, but if you feel like it's like, you know, you don't want to use it, I won't use it. And, but he was like, nah, go for it. <laughs> okay. But yeah, if it, something seems very clearly like based on someone in my family, then I will I will ask permission. I find that most of the time when I um, write about people in my family, um, they don't see it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, my cousin's going to be so mad. And then she calls and she's like, what a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of times there's things that are really resonant with us are things they're not aware that they did so they don't see it so I mean you know be, be tasteful and thoughtful but so forth <laughs> there, there's a New Yorker cartoon that circulates on Twitter every once in a while um, about um, people standing at a book signing and saying to the author, if we'd known you were going to be a writer, we would have treated you better. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have your chance. <laughs> so true. So true. Other question? Oh, I have a question. Go for it. Um, so specifically for uh, now Rabbi Art, <laughs> um, I'm very interested in the use of that voiceover on that show. And for so for such a long time, it's like don't ever do voiceover. Uh, and now it feels like it's a trend because I've seen other shows also use voiceover in a similar way. Can you talk about how that came to be? Why John Macro of all people? <laughs> uh, you know, um, yeah, it, I mean, I think we can all agree John Macro is an odd choice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a voiceover for a teenage Indian American. <laughs> um, but I think. When Mindy and I were sort of figuring out who this character was, you know, on the Mindy project, Mindy had a little voiceover that she would do at the top of every episode. And she, you know, and, and it would usually like you'd hear, like you'd see the skyline of like New York and you'd hear her talking, and then you would like realize she was like, you know, talking to like a like hot dog vendor who was like, get out of my way. <laughs> um, and you know, we like I worked on that show for a while, we loved doing that, but then we also realized like because teenagers are so private and kind of are, like their emotions are so like inexplicable to them, even themselves. Like it's always good to have these in, in like a teenager's head to know like what they are feeling. Um, so we, we decided we wanted to give her a voiceover. And then we were trying to decide, you know, what, that voiceover should be. I don't remember when we decided that it should be like a, just a totally different person, but we did like we were very like set on having her be like a really angry kid. And I think Mindy particularly wanted to sort of thwart the stereotypes of you know like young Asian girls as being like diffident and like pushovers and like a wallflower. She wanted to make sure. This girl like was you know more like her and had a temper and like, you know, like, was just like you know uh, had a big personality and so when we were like she's gonna be angry I think we were like who is the embodiment of rage <laughs> <laughs> and then you know we thought like it kind of it also like had this sort of twofold thing of like also we we you know. Um, both Mindy and I have uh, families that were huge tennis fans, and she, you know, according to her, like it's like a, a, a very popular in Indian families that they're crazy for tennis. So she, her dad, Mindy's actual dad, is like a huge John McEnroe fan, and so we decided to make uh, Davy's dad a John McEnroe fan. So he's not only like the embodiment of her actual anger, but he is this tie to her father, who is has passed so um so that was like kind of the main thing and then like just on a purely entertaining level like he's just so funny <laughs> you know he i love him like reacting to like the boys because, like, 
Master and all your sheep up. And so the jawline that can shave cheese. <laughs> Just like freaking out about like teenage drama. But, but yes, I think that's kind of how we think about it. So really a discussion in the room, even just between the two of you as you were creating the show, it was your yeah, shared like discussion. Yeah, these ideas until we were both like, should we just like, see if he was doing it? We are I'm getting the signal. We only have a couple minutes, so I wanted to see if any of y'all, if y'all together, have any kind of final things you want to say about the world writing or things going in part to people who are obviously listening again in the Zoom audience. So everyone who listens is an interesting writing career. So I think start with your family. I'm going to bring it back to the theme. I like it. <laughs> um, I was the youngest in my family, and so I was the observer. And uh, when we would have my, family, my parents had a talk with one of those kids, all of us, it was like a family thing. And you know, I could see like, why did she just tell the truth? And so, why didn't they just admit it? And this, you know, you know, so, I was the observer of everybody in the family. And um, of course, I never got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Observe your family. Um, I would also say talk to your elders and get their story um, before they're gone. Because there are stories they can tell you that are like, wow, you did what? <laughs> and that happened and you didn't do that. Talk to your elders. I love that. I love that. Right. Um, this is going to sound like trite, but I do think that be true to yourself, um, like kind of know your voice and like what what like actually makes you feel like you want to be a storyteller and who you are as a storyteller. I think, you know, uh, once again, particularly for the, the women watching, like I think sometimes we try to like change ourselves to like, especially if you have to work for like a male showrunner and you try to like make yourself tougher, or, like do like, and do your boy humor or whatever, like you're, you know, this is for comedy rooms, but like, but I think you, uh, there's oftentimes a, a feeling of needing to change yourself to fit the the room. And while you do have to write in the voice of the show when you write these scripts, you can bring your own like sense of style to it. And I think, I think, I think it's very important to me, I feel like, I don't know if you guys agree, but I, I think that the spirit of a project oftentimes is the thing that makes it the most winning. And it's like, when it comes from a place of ego or trying too hard, you can smell it a mile away. You can, you know, if, you can, if you're trying to, to like fancy something up because you think this is like what the world wants right now, or if you cynically create a show that feels like it checks boxes, like everyone can tell, you know? And when you, you know, when you write something that is something that like moves you or like means something to you, whatever the subject matter is, I don't know what it's like to be a teenage Indian American girl, but like I know what it's like to be a young woman who has like a lot of problems, <laughs> you know, and like was a nerd and like wanted to like have this like sexy cool life and did it, you know, like I know those things and like so I will bring that to this and and, and then you know, but like. Find out what's authentic to you and like and, and use that. Absolutely, because you are unique, your journey is unique, so your story should be unique. There is a story that only you are capable of telling, and it's a story the world needs to hear.